Matzik, and I'm visiting the Tone Arola family today. Tone is an old cattleman here. He's 90. How old are you, Tone? Going on 92. Going on 92 years old. Uh, his family is pretty much a pioneer family in Calaveras County, and we're going to talk about cattle. Now, uh, Tone, people have told me that you were driving cattle from this country up the mountains to summer pasture as late as, oh, 1965. Oh, yes. Yeah. Been driving cattle to the mountains ever since I was a little kid. He's uh, able enough, uh, big enough to ride a horse. Used to help round up the cattle and drive to the mountains. And, but the first trip I ever made was on a wagon. Uh-huh. With a hook of mine, just to haul hay up for the horses up there in the, during the summer and in the fall of the year when they had to have hay. And uh, that was the first. And I thought it was really wonderful to, to ride up the road. How old were you? Oh, I was only about eight years old then. So, so you went up to the mountains with your dad? So after that, uh, then I went to the mountains with my father with the cattle when I was about 10, driving the cattle up the road. Well, it could have been a little before 10 because they made it a forest reserve in 1905. And uh, I know very good and well I was up there before they, well, that would be right, before the 1905, uh -huh. because 1905 I'd have been put near about 12, 14 years. Uh -huh. Anyhow, uh, ever since then, I've been going to the mountains horseback and driving cattle for myself and for different ones, helping them drive cattle to and from the mountains. But there's nothing nowadays that's like it was those days, because they've got trucks now to haul them. You don't have to linger along the road, the old dusty roads. Oh, and dust. Oh, a dust to rise yeah. in your face would be why you couldn't hardly see out of your eyes. Huh. And especially if it was raining and it got a little wet, you'd have to have something to really, uh, really clean your eyes or, because you couldn't even see the dog down to fall in the battle alongside the horse. Holy Christopher, uh, that's a dirty uh, job, huh? Yeah. I used to wonder how the Teamsters driving all those mules and horses, 14 and 16, driving big loads of logs and lumber out of the mountains. Later on, when they put the lumber yards way up, and before it was logs for the mine, and my gosh, that was terrible, right? They yes. were right in a real mess. Messy job. And us going up the road with the cattle, and with the big, loads of lumber and so forth coming down the road with the teams was quite interesting. I guess. <laughs> but later on when they got the, the old caterpillars on the road, then that was, that was really something <laughs> more interesting to us, but more aggravating oh. in driving cattle because uh, they didn't want to go by these uh, big tractors. They made so much noise and we'd either have to hold the cattle up if we heard the tractor coming on a good wide place on the road or they would stop too lots of times. And, and let the cattle go by? And let the cattle go by. By the time we went up there with the cattle right here at Dorrington, why it was uh, getting drier and they didn't have the amount of snow that they used to have. Cricks wasn't as high. Oh, that's and right, because you went up for summer. Then yeah. later on, when we changed from 1912 and began to go higher up, then we run into high water, mm -hmm. because there was lots of snow up at Bear Valley and in that country and up at, high, uh, at uh, uh, Highland Lakes. Highland Lakes. and, and uh, we had to swim across the head of the Stanislaw River, made the cattle swim, and there wasn't use of swimming such big rivers. 
but that was pretty swift there and coerced us guys not realizing that they could wash some of the cattle down the river, but we always turned them up, up the river, pretty much on this side, so when they went across, they could land down by the time they swum, because they could never go straight across. Mm -hmm. The water was too swift, uh -huh. and they had some place to land just below. Oh. So this all turned out pretty good. And then later on, when we went up above, why, it was the same thing. I remember Mrs. Adams one year when I went in with, that was Mama Spina's cattle and all, I helped drive them up. And we helped Mrs. Adams across the head of the uh, McCallamy River, right at uh, Blow Highland Lakes. Uh -huh. And went right across on the snow with the water was running up the deep. Oh, big head of water. Huh. And we uh, thought, well, she wanted to go to the range that day and turn the cattle loose. And the boys didn't think so, so they had a, quite a discussion over it because the river was pretty high. But by God, there was so much snow that they passed all the cattle on top right on oh. over the river and up to <laughs> islands and on down and over to Clark's Fork. And then she, that's at, where she camped, just had her tent at the head of the Clark's Fork and, uh, and went to Iceberg with her cattle. So she got feed down on the Iceberg because it was so much earlier up there. It seemed like the born places are down the canyon and face towards the south. Why, they got much more feed than that, than they did higher up because the north sides had nothing at all. Mm -hmm. well, so, well, when you went up to the mountains now, you drove your cattle all the way from here we are and uh, just below Angel's Camp, yeah, and you yes. went all the way up there with these cattle. Uh, when you got there, did, did you stay there all summer with your cattle? Yes, but we went so far, way up above. Mm -hmm. When we got way above during July, and then I had to stay there pretty much all summer with the cattle. The uh, Forest Reserve uh, sort of compelled us to, uh -huh, you to had... uh, take care of the cattle and be sure that it was on our allotment and not on somebody else's. else's. So therefore, then we we had to stay, and I used to come down once, once in the summer. Just once during the summer. And then huh? go back. Now, you, you had an allotment up there because uh, no one had fences in those days, right? I mean, no one had fences, and you just drove them up, and all the cattle kind of mingled, uh, and everyone camped oh, yes. out and watched their cattle. Oh, yes. When they went to the mountains, the cattle all intermingled pretty much. Uh, but they all went to the same allotment that the uh, first went to. Chances are years before, a few years, certain cattle went in a certain place, they run there, they always go back to the same place. They know where to go on and their own. Then the young cattle would go too. Lots of cattle used to fight here to go to the mountains, go right out through here and, and go to the mountains up the road and pass these uh, uh, donkey engines they, that was hauling lumber out, uh -huh. be surprised. They used to go up the road by gullies and pass by them and, and uh, nothing, you just think they'd get scared and go off in the woods and stay, but no. Just they, go right on by. <laughs> right on by and go to where they've run before, see. And was a, my Uncle Gus had a blind cow that for, I guess, uh, six, about five, six years or more, old cow, nice big high horns. She went to the mountains blind. Huh. And she'd go up and get to the gates and hug up to the gates, because they had a gate right in front of our house there. Go uh -huh. to the Then way later on there was one in Red Hill, but that was only about the two gates. Oh. But she, of course, there were gates down on the ranch, and how she got out, I don't know, I guess somebody left her out. But they'd leave her out at these gates because she hung right up against the gates and, and 
they leave her go with her, go. And let her go up and, the mountains, huh? Well, <laughs> she knew she the way. Did, and in the fall of the year, she'd come back. <laughs> nobody drove her up, nobody drove her back. She, she knew where to go. She'd go and knew when it was time to uh, come. Huh. And find a way in the end, a few years after, three or four years, she got older and got pretty, pretty old. Because she was older when I uh, first knew her. Yeah. She was, I guess, maybe two or three years old then. Mm -hmm. And uh, she died up there mm -hmm. on, across the South Fork, close to the Gil Gillum Ranch. Mm -hmm. Now, Tone, when you took your cattle up to the mountains like that and you stayed there with them all summer, who did the cooking? We did. You cooked? Yes, <laughs> indeed I cooked. Did you? Well, tell me about that. I know how to fry eggs and bacon, but we used to have beef there too in the Dutch oven. Mm -hmm. We made bread in the Dutch oven, made yeast, with the yeast cakes we made the yeast uh -huh. with the potatoes. Uh -huh. You know, you made these out of potatoes. Yes. Well, then we made bread in the Dutch oven. We killed a calf from meat during the summer, and we uh, divided up with different neighbors, cattlemen, and then when they killed, they divided up with us. Uh -huh. And used to put the calf head in the in the uh, Dutch oven and cook it. When we'd leave in the morning, we'd put all the uh, Hot coals, we started in a fire the night before, uh -huh. and put the hot coals all over the head, calf of the head or the bread, or whatever it was cooking. And when we come in during the evening for supper, why? It'd be all done. It'd be yeah. all, you might say that the main thing would be done for our meal, uh -huh. either the beef or uh, and the bread. And, uh, well, you couldn't eat a whole, if you, if you killed a calf, and even if you shared it with your neighbors, you couldn't keep a whole calf uh, fresh during no, the summer. Wrapped it up in the daytime. To keep the flies and, off of it. To keep, to keep the cool in there. Uh -huh. And it was just as cool at night as the morning we put it in there, you might say. Then we'd hang it up every night outside, and then have to wrap it up every day, too. So it would last that way for, oh, seemed like, to me that time, seemed to me like we had beef there as much as, and as long as six weeks, hmm. see? But <clears throat> in the later years, as I got older, here quite a, just a few years ago, the weather got so much drier, and it changed so fast in the summer, we didn't have the, Thunderstorms we used to have to keep the ground, to keep the country cooler, and mind you, you couldn't keep beef. Hmm. But, well, yes, I done a little hunting towards the last. I never, I never used to hunt when I was uh, oh, younger because I was interested in looking out the cattle and. We didn't have as many hunters coming in, either into the country, it seemed like it. But after they got the automobiles going, then lots of hunters came into the country, more so. Before you had to have pack horses, mm -hmm. and that was the thing that all of them didn't have, and it was so far to go, mm -hmm. so many days to get there, because they didn't have trucks either to truck right. horses. So, by golly, they, they uh, uh, hunters come in so fast, you'd be just in the, oh, in the first two or three years, you'd, it'd surprise you how many hunters used to come in after they had, could come up there with the automobiles hmm. and go hunting. What did they hunt for? Um, they'd hunt for deer and then go fishing besides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, What kind of animals would you see when you were up there in the mountains? Did you have lions or? You know, we had. There's a uh, deer by the dozens. Oh, I and, bet. And uh, I only, only once, I saw a lion track plenty, but I only saw a lion once, once was in my life. After you were up in the mountains uh, with your cattle and it was time to come down, uh, did the cattle know where to go when it was time to come down? 
I mean, they, oh, yeah. they went up by the, pretty uh, much by themselves. I mean, you drove them up or you led the way? The cattle always knew about what we was doing with them. They did. Uh, here in the summertime, getting hot weather, they were ready to go to the mountains. They liked and it. Sometimes you couldn't hold them back. You'd get through the fence and a few heads could get away and go up the road, even from the fellows way down on Bear Mountain. But anyhow, uh, in the fall, you get the uh, autumn wind and cold nights, frost. A lot of those cattle would want to sh start out and come mm -hmm. home. They know the so time. we had to start rounding up right away, or I guess we'd had cattle scattered all, <laughs> all over the road, plenty of them, yeah. from the home ranch to the mountains. Mm -hmm. But in that respect, they were ready to go, and so was we. And mighty glad to get out of there because it could come a big snowstorm, which it did several times, almost. Hmm. You got us caught up there in the mountains with the cattle. Hmm. That's something you'd have to be careful for, huh? Oh, well, you got to be careful in the fall of the year. Because, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like even last year or two years ago, last year or two years ago, it didn't snow the way late. Mm -hmm. Then when it snowed, I think it was just last year, it could have caught Billy up there, which it did, but uh, I don't mean three or four feet of snow, but only about a foot, foot and a half of snow on the high elevation. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, uh, you could have caught a lot of cattle uh -huh. in there, but he was lucky enough the storm was small. went by and, uh -huh. and snow melted, and he got the cattle out. He got out. The cattle were strung out too far. We had to hold the leaders back until the uh, tail end caught up. Uh -huh. And if I had a good place to hold them all, if it was real hot and the tongues was out pat, patting, mm -hmm. that they were really short on breath, we would have to hold them a little longer, then go on again mm -hmm. to the next place and stop them again. And then coming on down the road, then at our final last separating would Valacito, uh -huh. where cattlemen went to different ranches and all. So you had a whole bunch of them yeah. from several cattlemen down there. Oh, yes, oh yeah. And then uh, yeah. you give them a rest. Well, then how would you get them all separated out? Then uh, they all had a different brand. They had a different mark, and the uh, cattle themselves would sort of drift off to one side if the road was out here going west, another road going south, or one going maybe south over here uh -huh. or, or uh, east, those cattle would drift off. In their own direction. To those places, and you just ride in and get them up, and then let them go out slow. You let those certain cattle go this way, and the others go the other way because you knew the brands, you knew the marks, and it was so easily done where uh, the cattle were used to it, like if you was to do that today, I don't think I don't think you could do it. If the cattle intermingled too much and run together too much, then it's an awful job to separate them. Hmm. You can't you can't do it that easy. Well, did you 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 were telling me that you had this little call that you called them and your cattle yes, would recognize uh, you and your call. You, uh, when you get up to move your cattle, we always call them. Then they knew we was ready to go. They might all lay down, as I told you, but we'd stop to let them rest. And then after a little, we'd get up and <coughs> give us our, give them a call, and and the cattle all begin to get up and head out. Come huh? on, and then the, the cow punchers would holler and bingo. The cattle was up and on the road. Well, what did you and, holler? So we just called them, uh, because they always went on the lead in the mountains when it was off of this main highway road. But we used to do it on the highway road too, like when the uh, donkey engine was coming, or any or a big load, mm -hmm. a lot of mules and a load of lumber. We would have to take the lead and call them, and it'd be. Hoo! Sick, sick, sick. 
Uh -huh. and the cows knew it. And they knew your and voice. And fall out and fall out uh -huh. because he was on the lead. And then that's what come in handy later on in the mountains going across country through the timber. We always uh, try to be in the lead where there was off trails and off roads. We always took the lead and call them and then cattle were right there following you. The main leaders were the strong ones and the mm -hmm. you know, more vigorous and they kept right along with us <laughs> until we would get ready to stop them. Then we'd have an awful time stopping them too. Oh. <laughs> we'd have to have a little salt with us. Just uh, I did. I packed a little salt uh -huh. in the sack and throw it down on the log or rocks, kind of scattered like. Uh -huh. And then they'd have quite a little time licking, licking, licking at it. By that time, the tail ends caught up. I see, so then that was a trick. <laughs> then give the end, tail end a, a little rest too, which you had to, because the calves, calves had to have rest. Well, when you were up in the mountains, uh, did you brand up there or did you brand down here? No, we never brand in the mountain. You did it here before uh, you went, huh? You had to brand here because if you took an animal up there without any mark and without any brand, maybe you'd never get it back. Yeah, that's right. Somebody else would get it. That's right. So you had to brand. But I marked them up there. Of course, the mark don't mean nothing. You can cut the mark out and put them in a different Oh, mark. that's right. But, uh, but, well, uh, but I used to cut them up there, the little calves, when uh -huh. I went on the meadow here, back in, up above the around 22 and 23 around Gabbert Meadows. Why, uh, then I used to catch them every time I saw a little one out on the mm -hmm. country. I'd throw the rope on him and down him and castrate him and knock him. Back up. And then if the mother died with that larkspur, that's what made me do it. Because if the mother died, the other fellow says, oh, that's my calf. I oh. says, no, that ain't your calf. I know the mother of that calf, so therefore he quit arguing with me, and I marked the calves from then on, and never heard no more argument about <laughs> anything, see? Uh, yeah, I suppose it could get into some tangles up there over oh, calves. Oh, sure. You bet you're right you could have. <laughs> yeah. If you were just hot-headed and quick and say you're a, you know, yeah. a liar or you want to be a thief or something else, <laughs> you could have really got into trouble, but you had to be a little bit careful. Yes, of course. These people are your neighbors after all, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you were telling me about marking cattle, that not only did they brand, but they, oh. some had a dewlap and yeah. some had, tell me about oh, that. Yeah, that's right, too. We got to go all over that. <laughs> uh, you know, some would mark a dewlap, uh -huh. would go back on under their chin uh -huh. to their throat. Uh-huh. So they just cut it with a knife? Just cut it with a knife, for uh -huh. sure. And then cut out on the, if they want that to hang from the throat down, I, they'd cut the front of it off. Mm -hmm. And if they started at the throat and come out, then they'd cut right under the chin, mm -hmm. under the jaw. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the, the dewlap, they call it. Mm -hmm. Then some of them dewlapped on the brisket. Mm -hmm. They got a brisket, you know hangs down here. Some of them put two dewlaps or three, mm -hmm. and maybe two dewlaps, cut them one way and then go down. Then they cut that another one go down. Then the others come up on them, and they're they upward. But then that'd be different if just so you look at them, you know. Then they had a jug handle. See, and the jug handle was where you cut the brisket. The brisket hangs down, and you just cut it and leave that hole in it. Don't cut it. Oh. You know, and it's there. And it, so this would all heal up, you know? Oh, yeah. they, they just all heal all up? All heal up, and it was never bothered with flies or nothing. nothing. That's what I could never understand. And my father used to cut them. He'd get a handful of dust and throw it in there. I said, what are you doing that for? Well, it's just to dry them up. So mm -hmm. it's day blood all over. You don't see the blood. <laughs> I don't know. So that's the way it went. And but then after that, my gullies and years afterward, years though, quite a few years, 
than was a blowfly or would bother him. And, hmm. and, uh, and a lot of medicine. I'd have given her medicine all the time for this and that. Hmm. She, well, it was cleaner in the early days, don't you think? Well, the soil was cleaner. Yes. And I think that's why these dust, if you put them in and I would think that, God dang it, it they might get infected. Mm -hmm. But they didn't. They never did. Huh? But uh, this larkspur that you're telling me about, what was that all about? The uh, the cattle had a problem with the larkspur. You said some oh, cattle died. Oh yeah, cattle used to bloat, bloat from larkspur, the same as they would bloat down here from alfalfa. Oh. You, you turn them in off of this dry feed and into and even into a nice lushy green feed here, mm -hmm. nice tender, they'll bloat. Mm -hmm. And first thing you know, they key lower. Uh, well, the dairymen yet are bothered with cattle bloating down below <laughs> because they dash and let them get too hungry. There's something about it. They eat too fast mm -hmm. and they need too much at too soon a time, and that causes gas and bingo. They tip over huh. before you know it. Well, what did you do when you yeah. went up there and it was open range and uh, your cattle were just roaming around? How could you prevent them from eating the wrong things? What did you do? Say, that's what made me quit the mountains up higher up where the dip larkspur was. We started digging it out uh -huh. and that was okay. But uh, we didn't have enough cattle over on this particular range and uh, we traded uh, with another cowman off of the McCallany River. He took what I had over there, mm -hmm. and I took what he had over on the McCallany. Uh -huh. And uh, then uh, I lost, uh, what made me get anxious to get out of there was the first year I lost 19 head, the second year, I think 21, and the third year, 23. So there were 63 heads that we lost in three years. Time. Have you been a cattleman? I mean, you, your father was a cattleman before you, and then you took over his ranch? Did you take over your dad's ranch? Oh, yeah, I took over my father's ranch, and I took up land out there, too, out of isolated land. Mm -hmm. and. And that's why I took over all the ranches and all the uh, all the uh, holdings when I got older, and that was okay with him. And so now you've been ranching then since the early 1900s to. Oh yeah. How, when did you quit ranching? Say, when I was a little guy, I said it. I was born in '93. When I was eight years old. In 10, I was throwing the plow around and plowing a lot of land, punching cows when I was eight years old, packing out, selling cattle, and helping Mark and Brand. And uh, then later on, when I was around that 10, 12 years old, 14, I began hauling wood to town. We put in our grain, done the plowing, and put the grain in the whole wood to Angel's Camp. So a lot of customers. And uh, then I got a few dollars for wood. And I thought it was pretty good, too. Pretty good life? But as I said to my father, well, it don't hardly pay. Well, he says, that's the way it goes. Nobody else is is doing any different to make all the money. The cattle's cheap, everything is cheap, and it's just got to make the best of it and do the best we can. Do the best you can. And it'll come out. So sure. says, oh, I guess so. That's the way it went. That's the way it goes. <laughs> <laughs> so seven dollars a cord then for wood. Oh. And now it's a hundred and forty. Don't come with a hundred and fifty dollars yes. a cord. Oh boy. <laughs> That's out of the question when you're out in the hills uh, to pack blocks of salt. Yeah. We always salted with fine salt. Mm -hmm. Fine salt. Mm -hmm. See, you could, and as I always looked for was a burnt 
big burnt log mm -hmm. with a lot of charcoal on it mm -hmm. and sprinkle the salt all along with charcoal and the cattle used to lick that salt and lick that charcoal and it make them sick and look like a like the rose shedded and they huh. just shine <laughs> from the uh, from the because it got rid of them. if there was any worms in them mm -hmm. or anything oh. this hard black coal would kill a lot of that and the cattle look so much slicker I'll be done huh. yeah you know, huh. yeah and then calling them really boy you call them and you'd hear them cattle bawling as far as they could hear and the way they'd come. And they used to say up there, Johnny Hunter, a fellow used to take care of the flume for the Utica Company. He says, John, that's my father. He says, I can't hear anybody calling as far as you. We <laughs> used to hear him call way off hmm. and nobody else would ever holler that loud. <laughs> and that's the way I always hollered loud too and they could hear me way off and the cattle knew damn well it was they knew when Tonarola was cold. coming huh yeah <laughs> no way they come so it was kind of nice to think do you see them coming you, know, you love those cattle a, didn't you yeah oh yeah when I was a kid. did you did you have uh, any dances or do anything like that or picnics when you'd come back down from the mountains Oh, yes, when I got older, I used to go to dances, uh -huh. and I don't know why. You don't know why? <laughs> lots of them, uh, I go to the dance and have a big hell of a blue of a time, as the fellow <laughs> says. But uh, I never went. A lot of the boys said, come on, we got to go down and have a drink. But not me. And to let them go down and get a drink, get stewed, and then get in and have a big powwow. <laughs> big fight. Over <laughs> no, I never done that. <laughs> well, did you? T but I you know. were talking about people dancing on the big tree, yeah. the big stump. You did that, yeah. though. Oh yeah, Vince and I danced on that big tree up there. Oh yeah, and then I used to go to dances. They had a little dance hall there at uh, Durrington. Oh. And one time when I was sick after I got that. Uh, that big snowstorm I was telling you before in the mountains, I got congested lung and got sick and got damn near died, very near died from it, and uh, oh, I have nothing left of me. So when I began to get better, then I went up and up there and stayed at Dorrington uh, in the summer for oh, two, three weeks, I guess. Then from there, I went to Gabbard Meadows, but they used to dance out there, and I never had no wind to dance then. But later on and in the years, when I did, and I was going with Bessie, then we danced up here and danced up at Dorrington, and the, the different ones around the country here that used to be up there, like down here, there's a bunch of Bums girls right below us, and all happened to meet up there, they were camping out, and we'd dance and have a good time. Have a gay old time, you huh? Know, well, uh, I know that, you're, that you used to have property out there by Moaning Cave and down by Natural Bridges. Well, that's, and, uh, that's when the bands used to come out there and play. Oh, what bands were those? The one from Angels and the one from San Andres. So I think George Street and some of those boys from San Andreas used to sing and play in the band. And they used to come over there too, and then Angels band were over. Pretty near every Sunday, there was something going on over there, it seemed like it. The people all walked over there, my there was no automobile. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's a long and way. You'd, you'd be surprised <laughs> how many people there was over there. The rest of the miners around town, they never went much, you know. There was mostly the, the local folks would just local trip on down from, to the natural bridges? And the ones that were scattered out, and they'd come from, some would come from Murphy's, mm. and some from San Andres, Maloney's, and my guys all meet up there and have lunch and listen to the band play. I'll be darned. Yeah. Oh. Between the times, old man Barnes went to Angels, he walked to Angels to get his groceries, mm -hmm. and he always came down by our house. Before you get to the Obelix Flat there where the fairgrounds is, uh -huh. you come down that way, shortcut. And then you go back, and my mother always got him 
a bite to eat. Uh -huh. If he come along, she'd ask him, aren't you hungry, or this or that. And, uh, so sometimes he'd have a bite to eat, and sometimes he, he wouldn't. wouldn't. And go on with a pack on his back. And I often wondered how he made his living. And I said, ask him. Oh, uh, he says, somebody, what little gold I get, and what little, sometimes people give me two bits or 50 cents, and he says, oh, I get by. I get by. He just gets by. <laughs> so that's right. He just got by. Yeah, just got by. Yeah. There was good hospitality in those days. Oh, yeah. yeah. They had a big trail, you know, from that upper bridges, all dug around that hill, uh, coming towards Angels, you know. Mm -hmm. Then they got out open, then they dug a, on the trail, going around the other hill, and mm, they done a lot of work on that trail. Well, when you when you took cattle down uh, to market, like you went into Stockton or Oakdale to sell your cattle, uh, you were also driving them. Did you stop and have lunch with the folks on the way? Well, we generally brought our lunch with us the first day uh -huh. because we had to go over Bear Mountain, the shortcut, as I told you. Yeah. And then uh, we'd make it to Copper and I'd curl my cattle at Raleigh Flowers and uh, sometimes further down the road at Murphy's, different places where the night overtook us. Then we'd take them on for the next day to the 28-mile house. They would pick them up and take them in with a uh, truck. And see, well, that was before, now what I'm telling you, that's before the the, uh, or after the train quit in Milton. But when the train was working in Milton, we used to drive them mostly a shortcut down and across where the reservoir is, up and hit the road out here by the pool station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then go on down the road. And I used to, sometimes, we had to weigh the cattle. So if we had to weigh them, we'd come to Alleville. Mm -hmm. And I drove right through Angels and weighed them at Alleville. Then mm -hmm. drove them on down the road and uh, to Milton. But it took uh, a day, and I could spend all day to day, and it'd be dark where we put them because it was hot, and you couldn't drive them too fast. Oh, right. And uh, then the next morning, get in early enough that they could load them, and so the cattle had a rest mm -hmm. early enough, and then get them loaded on the train, and the train took off, and I come home. Well, where did they take them? Like, uh, well, they're from San Francisco, mostly. Oh, I see where all the city people are mostly. waiting for their hamburger. <laughs> well, um, you were a cattleman of the year. You were named cattleman of the year by the Cattlemen's Association. Yeah. yeah. Once or twice? That's right. Tone, I know this is an old brand, and it's your brand, and now it's your son's brand. That, that, that was my father's brand. Oh, it was your father's. And mine, up to here a few years ago, and then we turn, I turned it over to the oldest son of mine. Uh -huh. So he still holds it, and branding all the cattle that he goes to the mountains with, here and there, whatever he owns, why they got the double A on. <laughs> well, that brand that, has seen that, a lot of use. That's, oh yeah, that's a lot of use. And then that's made with the square A's, not the rounding, curves, like uh, if there were, it was eight square, and that's why we got those pl places pitted out here next to the bar, to the A and in the center where the two A's meet. So it shows up. This is one of the oldest brands in, registered in the state of California. Yeah, that's right. That's, yeah, I think that's, when was that? It's back of the year, 18. 1860 something, I think. Hmm. 18, I had the year of the old age on, uh -huh. on, on my brand too, and that was about the same. It's really, it's really nice to come up and talk to you today, and um, it's, 
it's uh, a little glimpse into the past through your eyes, taking a cattle drive up the hill and back down again. Oh, yeah. Those days were pretty exciting. I think they're exciting, and I'm sure our audience will, too. Yes, and yeah. that is something that's interesting to me to talk about the old times. Why, sure. Uh, since I've uh, uh, really sat down many a time and considered the difference in today and what it was then, uh, it's really really something. It sure the is. The way the person does nowadays to what they used to do. Yes. It's so much easier. Oh, for See? sure. So it's nice talking with you and I enjoyed it very much. Well, I did too. Yes. Thank so you so that, much. Yeah, same to you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.